recently uh, a number of hackers got into the government gmail accounts prior to that uh, they had accessed information on hundred million sony accounts in 77 million of those cases they gained access to both email and credit card information a little bit before that there was the arab spring there were revolts in tunisia and then egypt and that has uh, obviously spread throughout the Middle East. Private Bradley Manning took a writable CD and disguised it as a Lady Gaga recording, took it into work, inserted it into his computer, plugged in the earbuds, and while mouthing the words to his favorite song, downloaded 250,000 State Department cables, and that became WikiLeaks history. On May 6, 2010, the Dow Jones Industrial Averages plunged by 1,000 points. It was followed by a rocket recovery of 650 points. The plunge of 650, or the initial plunge of 1,000 points, 650 of that point drop occurred in roughly five minutes. In late 2008, Three of Iceland's largest banks failed and took down the Icelandic economy. And then there was the world economic crisis of 2008. All of those things shared one thing in common. They were made more virulent because they include, <coughs> occurred in an interconnected, overconnected, internet-driven world. The question I want to talk with you about today is whether those events were outliers or just normal bad days in the office, the kind of thing that we should expect to see more and more of, and what the role of the internet plays in all those things. And I'd like to talk to you about some of the unintended consequences that are associated with the internet and how we can use the internet more responsibly. The way I'm going to do this is I'm going to give you a little bit of a historical perspective on interconnections and show you that throughout history they've been doing similar things. Then I'm going to define <clears throat> overconnectivity for you. Then I'm going to give you three examples of situations in which overconnectivity has been involved and has led to unintended consequences. And then we'll just open it up for questions. So in 2007, I attended a talk given by Buzz McCoy at Stanford University. Buzz was the former head of real estate for Morgan Stanley. And Buzz started off blaming consumers for being so naive as to buy all those overpriced homes. He then blamed the real estate salesmen. <clears throat> and then he went after the mortgage brokers and the banks and the investment banks. And he kept going and he didn't have very many nice things to say about Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Then he went after the government regulators and saved his choicest words for the credit rating agencies. And I couldn't resist at the end of his talk, which was a great talk, and I held up my hand and I said, you know, you've talked about and blamed everybody. You name it, you blamed it. But you didn't blame the internet. Why didn't you blame the internet for the real estate crisis? And at that moment, the room went absolutely dead still, and then everybody burst out laughing. And I knew that the laconic Bill Davidow was launched in a career to be a stand-up comic. <laughs> so when the laughter died, died, died down, I explained the role that it had played in increasing real estate appraisals, how the internet had been involved in creating the collateralized debt obligations <coughs> and uh, the credit default swaps that had helped finance the thing, how it had created a frenzy around real estate transactions, and how the internet had been involved in the automatic credit approval systems that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac had put into place. And pretty soon, heads were nodding. And at the end of the talk, somebody came up to me and talked to me about a $70 million real estate transaction that had <coughs> been concluded in the heat of an internet moment. And I've often thought about that, in that incident. And I thought, why didn't people realize the role that the internet was playing in all of these things. And I have concluded that the reason was that the internet was carrying invisible freight, information, the freight of the information age. 
but that if I had made that same statement Chicago in 1907 <coughs> instead of Stanford in 2007 and I'd said, hey, the railroad created the real estate growth in the Chicago area, everybody would have just looked at me and it would have been a non-issue. They would have seen the homes that had grown along the railroad tracks. They would have seen the buildings rise in the city. And as a matter of fact, one of the things that interested me about all of this is that the railroad had some of the same effects on Chicago that the internet is having on the world. Take disintermediation as an example. The idea that you can get with good connections rid of intermediaries. So we get rid of the travel agents. Well, the railroad did a wonderful job of that. Augustus Swift realized that shipping cattle to the East Coast from Chicago was a horribly inefficient process. Number one, the cattle got injured in shipment. Number two, you were shipping their innards that had no value at all. And number three, and worst of all, the cattle lost weight in the shipment process. So Swift invented the refrigerated rail car, butchered the cattle efficiently in Chicago, hung the carcasses vertically in the rail cars and really packed them in, and shipped only real value back to the East Coast and disintermediated the East Coast butchers. The railroad also created the world's first important um, virtual retailers, the Amazons of their day. All you need to do to create a great virtual retailer is you need a high bandwidth interconnection. Putting a catalog on a railroad train and shipping it to the prairies will do that and a good transportation system, Federal Express, UPS, or the railroad. That led to the creation of the first great virtual retailers, Sears and Roebuck and Montgomery Ward in Chicago. And then we know that interconnections have always been involved in financial innovation. And with the internet, we have seen a tremendous amount of financial innovation. But the first derivatives were a result of the railroad. Before the railroad, grain used to trickle into Chicago. It was brought on horse-drawn wagons and burlap bags with tags on them. <clears throat> and you put the bags in a warehouse. And then when the grain was sold, you ripped the tag off the grain and you compensated the farmer for it. But when the railroad came around, 100 trains a day were going into Chicago and leaving Chicago. And the trickle of grain became an absolute torrent. And at that point, the accounting became horrible. So 24 merchants and businessmen got together, and they created the idea for the Chicago Board of Trade. They took the wheat and graded it by its quality. Then you could intermix the wheat. Then they handed the farmer a receipt. And the farmer then could sell that receipt to somebody else who would claim the grain. And then something really wonderful happened. The farmer learned he could sell the receipt before the grain was put in the warehouse and the futures market evolved. It was a very great thing. What happened in Chicago is that the railroad created a highly connected environment. And highly connected environments are great things. They stimulate economic growth. They stimulate a lot of prosperity. In the case of Chicago, it grew from a city of about 30,000 in the mid-1800s to around 1.5 million in the early 1900s. What I'm here to talk to you today about is overconnected environments. And overconnected environments create extremely challenging situations. There are two kinds of overconnectivity. The first of these is social overconnectivity. And the issues with social overconnectivity are issues of psychology, sociology, neurology, brain chemistry and issues of that nature, issues of behavior, how you will react. They are intimately involved in dopamine releases in your brain and cortisol releases, and I'll have more to say about that later. The other kind of overconnectivity, and the kind of overconnectivity that the book is about, is about institutional overconnectivity. <clears throat> and institutional overconnectivity involves regulation, governance, industry structure, business structure, things like this. <clears throat> and that kind of overconnectivity arises as a result of two things. Your environment 
consists of the things to which you are connected. And if I strengthen interconnections, and I increase their number, you go through an abrupt environmental change. And if you're in a different environment, you're liable to find yourself maladapted. So that's what's leading to problems with the bookstores and the newspapers. They are unable to deal in the new environment. Their structure is not adapted for that purpose. There's a second thing that happens. When you increase interconnections and you strengthen them, you create a lot of positive feedback. And I mean the term in an engineering sense, and I know a lot of you are engineers, but I'm going to say a word about positive feedback, and you'll have to forgive me. But if you take a complex system and unleash a lot of positive feedback in the complex system, it drives things to extremes. It creates contagions, thought contagions, economic contagions, electronic contagions, and it does something else. <coughs> it creates accidents. So what is happening here? If you think about positive feedback, it's all over our social processes and our economic processes. If you happen to be a kid and had a bank account that was paying you 2% interest, what happened is that interest was getting fed back into your account, and if you left your money alone for 36 years, it doubled. But if you increase the positive feedback in the system just a little bit, say increase it from 2% to 5%, you have much more rapid growth, and your savings double in 14 years. Now, what the internet is doing is taking a lot of the positive feedback processes that existed in our society, which are good things, and increasing the amount of positive feedback and creating some extreme situations. And that leads to a tremendous number of unintended consequences. Positive feedback was the thing that drove the growth in Silicon Valley. But positive feedback also played an extremely important role in the real estate crisis, the bankruptcy of the banks <coughs> in Iceland, and a number of other things. So what I'd like to do is give you uh, three examples of unintended consequences that are associated with the internet, and uh, explain to you about them. And I will assure you that positive feedback is involved in all of them. So along comes May 6th, 2010. The financial markets are a little bit edgy because there has been a crisis in Greece. There's still a crisis in Greece. And on that day, the markets plunged by 1,000 points. They were followed by what I refer to as the rocket recovery. They snapped back 650 points that same day. So the markets traversed uh, quite a distance. Now, there were two extremely important environmental changes that happened as a result of the Internet's changes in connectivity. <clears throat> the first of these happened because with the internet we created a lot of alternative trading systems. These were sort of, think of them as being electronic stock exchanges. If you had looked <clears throat> at the world in the year 2000 uh, and five, you would have found that the New York Stock Exchange did 80% of the share trades in the listed stocks. By the year 2010, their market share was down to around 30%. Those trades had moved to the alternative trading systems. And the alternative trading systems did not have things like stock specialists or circuit breakers in place. So this changed the way the trading environment was disciplined. There was something else that happened as well during that time period. There was the rise of high-frequency trading. And what high-frequency trading consists of is traders, actually computers, electronic brains trying to trick other electronic brains, looking for ways to arbitrage things. So that if I have an index of 100 stocks and it's priced too high, there's an opportunity for me to short the index and buy the underlying stocks, and when the prices converge, make a few pennies on a share. But enough pennies add up to um, tens and hundreds and millions and billions of dollars. 
<clears throat> so suddenly, high frequency trading grew in volume to the point where it was almost two thirds of the transactions on the markets. Machines trying to trick other machines. So along comes May 6, 2010, and we aren't quite sure what triggered the event, but we think it was a $4 billion short sale by Waddell Reed of E-mini S&P 500 futures. And we think that's what triggered it, but something triggered it. Suddenly chaos results in the market. Procter & Gamble stock is trading at $62 a share. It hits $56 a share. The New York Stock Exchange stops trading it. It hit the circuit breaker. The electronic systems find places that'll trade the stock for $40 a share. So the stock goes down temporarily to $40 a share, and by the end of the day, is back up trading at $60 a share. Or maybe you had the unfortunate experience of putting in a market order on Accenture, which was trading at $40 a share that day. The buyers fled the market. Nobody wanted Accenture. It got sold on the electronic exchanges at the stub quote price of a penny that day before it popped back to $39 a share at the end of the day. Now, I was tasked by Joe to raise some moral questions, and ethical questions, and unintended consequence questions as part of this lecture. The rationale for high frequency trading is that it creates liquidity. That's one of the things in the market. It basically, a lot of it is creating liquidity for other high frequency traders. It's not creating liquidity for the general market. That probably is a slightly controversial say, statement. It also is therefore for an important reason. It drives convergence between things like exchange traded funds and their composition. So it makes the market more efficient. And it, in fact, enables people to arbitrage things and makes the market more efficient. On the other hand, it extracts billions of dollars from the market in terms of profits for the high frequency trader. And I have been trying to figure out where that money comes from. And if it were only coming from other high frequency traders, that would be very interesting. But the high frequency traders keep multiplying. And my logic tells me that the smartest 5% would drive the other 95% out of business. And that doesn't seem to happen. So a lot of those profits have to be coming from the long-term shareholders and things like that. Also, when people make the efficiency argument, they overlook the electronic panics that occur in the market. Billions of dollars were lost by normal investors on that May 6th day. And if you take that into account, I suspect that high frequency trading doesn't look like it's that great a deal. So the question is, here we had something that leveraged the internet. It today is creating more volatile markets. And there are people who believe that lots of people are no longer investing in the stock market because of the tremendous amount of volatility. So that is one of the questions, ethical, moral, that I would like to have you think about. I would like to give you a positive feedback analysis of your loss of privacy. Uh, everybody knows your privacy is gone. Uh, and uh, it happens because of positive feedback. And think of it this way. If I know one piece of information about you, your name, it's not worth very much. But if I've got your name, your telephone number, your credit card number, your social security number, I know where you shop on the internet, I know the magazines you subscribe to, I know the blogs you attend. As I add more and more of that information, each piece of information makes the information I have, other pieces of information I have, more valuable. That's a positive feedback process. Now, we do something wonderful. We enable you to put all of that information in one place. The internet enables us to concentrate it. And then, 
we reduce the cost of collecting it because we can collect it at the cash register every time your credit card is swiped. So you've got something that makes it extremely profitable and valuable to create, as ChoicePoint has done, a 250 terabyte book or data bank or massive file, which is roughly, uh, they've got a roughly about a megabyte on every economically active and inactive citizen in the United States. A megabyte, that's roughly a 200 page book on you. It's extremely valuable data. Now, ChoicePoint was spun out of Equifax, and uh, its original charter was to help people uh, locate uh, people they were going to hire that had criminal records. Uh, in five million searches, uh, they were able to identify about 400,000 people, and that was a pretty valuable service. ChoicePoint said, gee, this is great. The more data we acquire, the more customers we can acquire, the more we can charge for the data. So they went out and acquired 50 companies and grew their customer base to around 50,000 customers. They are selling that data, portions of that data, to every one of those 50,000 customers. For you to be safe, well, I guess another thing that happens, all that data is sitting on the internet. So before, if I wanted to steal that data, I had to physically go to the place. Now I can be in, in Russia or Kazakhstan or, or any place else, and thousands of data thieves can suddenly access this data. For your data to be safe, it has to be safe in 50,000 separate locations. There is no possible way that this can be done. As a matter of fact, ChoicePoint is able to do things that the government is prohibited from doing by the 1974 Privacy Act. But I suspect that the government just loves that they're doing it because, in effect, the FBI and the CIA have outsourced their data collection problem and can buy it <coughs> in the free market for things that they can't do in the government market. So there are some real questions here. Is why a private company can sell your data in this way and do things that the government can't do and, uh, and operate in that way? I see nothing wrong with me if uh, a retailer, Amazon, wants to collect data about me if it stays inside Amazon. But if Amazon is suddenly uh, selling it to other people, I think that creates great problems. The final thing I want to comment on is something that I've just become more and more interested in, and it's social overconnectivity. And this raises some, some real questions. Um, there are, two th there are lots of things that are going on. Uh, there are a number of psychiatrists that are studying our internet personality, and, and uh, the, uh, I suspect that internet addiction is going to be actually defined as a uh, behavior disorder at some point in the next five years. Uh, and probably the harbinger of that was the fact that we began calling things crackberries. Um, and, uh, so I don't think we've got a great name for Apple iPhones yet. But what we think is happening to people in a lot of these addictive environments is that they're getting dopamine releases. Dopamine is the neurotransmitter that is involved in the reward system in your brain. And you like getting shots of dopamine. Uh, one of the reasons why people enjoy taking cocaine is that it stimulates dopamine releases, which they seem to like. Uh, we know that uh, addicted gamblers, which are 2 to 4 percent of the hardcore gamblers, are probably driven by dopamine releases. What the studies show is that if you have unexpected, high reward, pleasurable events, you get dopamine shots. That's a good reason to stay at the gambling tables. Well, uh, for those of us who carry smartphones and who can't put them down and who have to answer every smartphone ring or look at every email that is coming in and who uh, just can't get away from those devices. And for those of us who are constantly being interrupted by bells going off on our computers, um, we are probably enjoying dopamine releases. 
Now here is where things really get interesting. Companies like Facebook, Google, and Zynga are engaged in analytics. And what they do is when they engage in analytics is they are studying your behavior and studying the things that keep you engaged. And whether they mean to or not is I suspect that they are designing addictive systems. And these things can have some extremely uh, significant consequences. So I guess if I didn't want to go to work for a smoking company or a cigarette company, uh, does that mean I shouldn't go to work for Zynga or Google or Facebook? It's something I've begun thinking about. There is something else that happens for those of us who are uh, continually multitasking. Linda Stone has another word for that. She calls it continuous partial attention. And uh, when she has looked at people who are engaged in continuous partial attention, she finds out that uh, sometimes they actually sort of stop breathing for a while. It, it's like when you're skiing and you don't take breaths and things like this. And that the activities that we're involved in, switching tasks and responding to all these alerts, uh, are stimulating cortisol releases. Cortisol is the stress hormone. It raises your blood pressure. It raises your heartbeat. And we're learning all kinds of interesting things about cortisol, uh, like it is involved in post-traumatic stress disorder. And when we study uh, soldiers who have returned from combat and do uh, MRI imaging of their brains, we find in certain cases their hippocampuses have shrunk by 10%. Uh, that's where a lot of your memory resides. So there is a real question here as to how we uh, learn to use these things responsibly and uh, how th this isn't something that I can envision the government regulating, but it is certainly going to be an issue when you grow up and or get older and have kids and things like this. And it's an issue uh, with how we discipline our lives. Well, a couple of years ago, um, I was in, what was it, Barnes & Noble bookstore in Kauai? They, they, it isn't there anymore. And uh, I, I was looking around, and uh, on, the, on the bookshelf, uh, I came across a copy of Flatland. And Flatland is a wonderful satirical Victorian novel, and I had never read Flatland. And it's a story about a square living happily in two-dimensional space. And suddenly he gets transported to three-dimensional space. And he realizes how wonderful it is to see spheres instead of circles, which he can't see because the circles are just straight lines and things like this. And he then returns to Flatland and begins preaching the benefit of the third dimension. The obvious thing when you engage in a seditious act is that somebody arrests you, and the square was arrested, and he was brought in front of the high priests in Flatland and sentenced to a long prison term in prison. Well, as I viewed the internet, I said, gee, it's added a fourth dimension to our lives. And I see that the high priests in our society, whether it be the regulators or the government officials or businessmen, and I think individuals as well, do not realize the implications of that fourth dimension. Our opportunity to create a more efficient, more effective, and more wonderful world with the internet is going to be directly a result of us being able to deal with some of these unintended consequences. So my challenge for you today is to just figure out how to do it. Thank you very much. So any questions? Yes.
all right. So, you know, the question is, I think, how do you pick the right amount of positive feedback? And it's an extremely difficult thing to do. Uh, and, and let me give you uh, two things. I, I, if I were the czar and I could do it, uh, what I would do is I'd run a great economic experiment. I would tax stock transactions a hundredth of a cent or a hundredth of a percent. And if the high frequency trading kept going at the same rate, I'd raise the tax until it got down to around 10 percent. That would be my solution. And it would only require, because the profit margins on high frequency trades are so small, probably a few hundredths of a percent tax to do that. But I wouldn't know how to set that beforehand. Now, I'd like to give you something else where it, it, it's almost inconceivable that you can figure out how to do this. The amount of over-the-counter derivatives the notional value of those derivatives that existed in the year 2000 was $60 trillion, the notional amount. If I wrote a derivative on a $10 million bond, that was $10 million in notional value. $60 trillion is equal to the economic output of every country in the world. I mean, that's a lot of money. By 2007, the notional value of over-the-counter derivatives had grown to over $600 trillion. That was a compounded annual growth rate of 40%. The Bank of International Settlements in the year 2007 published a paper where somebody estimated that the losses that might occur as a result of those derivatives was on the order of $1.7 trillion. In many cases, the people who had engaged in creating those derivatives, um, such as AIG, had no reserves. I suspect that if the Bank of International Settlements rewrote that paper today, they would pick a number closer to $5 trillion. The problem here is that things with positive feedback grow so fast that they reach monstrous size and they can take down the world financial system. This leads you to the left-wing communist-oriented position of saying you should begin regulating these things long before you have a problem. <laughs> now that may sound ridiculous, but 787s, we don't put people on 787s and fly them around the world <clears throat> and after 10 crashes say we should figure out the safety systems we put in place. So we are faced with this kind of crisis and having to deal with these things. And uh, I think those are the kinds of issues they raise and I don't have a neat answer for your question. Yeah. Uh, so you started your So there's a concept of digital natives and digital immigrants. You're talking about digital natives. Exactly. All right. I'm a digital immigrant. <laughs> so uh, here is the issue. Um, we do not know what even sitting in front of television is doing to people. I was reading a book the other day uh, that you know, and, and when your brain develops, certain things happen at certain times. Like you're much m more capable of learning language when you're young. And so there are certain points in your emotional development where certain things should happen. One of the reasons why you delay in learning manual dexterity skills is to let your brain cope with learning language. And these things are, are phase. We think that you learn a lot of your social skills in the frontal lobe of your brain when you're very young 
and you learn them interacting with people. And there are psychologists now that believe that the ability of people to socially interact is being diminished because their brain is not developing the right kind of connectivity when they're young. <clears throat> we are seeing lots of antisocial behavior that exists right now. Elias Abujad at Stanford uh, studies uh, these internet personalities. Um, what he's finding about them is that the typical internet personality, and a lot of these things are not at the point of personality disorders, some of them are, <clears throat> where <clears throat> people are more narcissistic, uh, they are less, uh, they're abrupt with other people, they aggrandize themselves, they have images of things that they aren't, <clears throat> and that these things overflow back into their social lives and create a lot of problems. So the answer to you is, I don't know how the digital natives are developing. What I do know is over two and a half million years, you co-evolved with your tools. We think that the use of stone tools is intimately related with the development of language. And we don't know which came first, but a lot of the wiring in the brain is, is intermixed there. <clears throat> and we know that as a result of our tools, we have always co-evolved with our tools. You know, for example, our digestive systems are about relatively about a third the size of the chimpanzee. The chimpanzee is our nearest re rel re relative is about five times relatively as strong. And we have a brain that is three times the chimp's size. We also learned how to use fire. So we needed smaller digestive systems, and we could use our brain to multiply our strength using stone tools. We have always co-evolved with our tools. Suddenly, in the past 20 years, we have been thrust into virtual environments, which are totally different, and they are real. Make no mistake about that. I mean, people are having romances in virtual environments and leaving their wives and things like this. It's, I guess it's great for them. Maybe it's not so good. I don't know. But they're real environments. And we do not know what those effects are going to be. So I am designed and you are designed for the physical environment that has existed for thousands and millions of years. And so uh, it, it, the question is uh, just what will happen to, as people uh, grow up and develop in these different environments. Yeah, way in the back. Uh, given that any stock trade that may just be the value is favorable rather than because of some fundamental market reason is just extracting value out of the market, isn't the high volume of trading just a better version of day trading that doesn't add any more or less to society? Well, all right. I'd, I'd like you to run the thought experiment for me. High frequency trading uh, is around 60% of what goes on in the stock market. <clears throat> and the thought experiment I'd like you to run is what happens if high frequency trading becomes 99% of the trading? And I think the answer you will reach is that stocks will trade based on what other computers think and will have no fundamental relationship to value at all. That's a, that's a good question. I, but I, I, I think that they, they tend to cycle around a fundamental relationship to value. Uh, th there was a study done by Brian Arthur at the Santa Fe Institute uh, where he, he built uh, models of, um, of trading, uh, an agent-based model of trading. And it was an interesting thing. And he found that there was more volatility in the market. The only way you could explain the volatility of the market were that other traders were acting on the beliefs of what other traders were doing. Uh, to the degree that that study was right, it was done a number of years ago. Uh, what we've got now 
is if you look at what's going on in high frequency trading, these systems are constantly probing the market and posting certain trades which they withdraw and things like this. And they're, they're, they're trying to discover the algorithm on the other side of the deal and then act on that. And uh, so uh, it, 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 I think you end up with a market where the trades are determined by what other traders think. Yeah. And then I know there are many hands up. After one more question, I'm hoping I can thank our speaker and you'll stick around for a bit. People okay. Down sure. Questions. Yeah. You talked about the fact that there are a lot of benefits to the internet and the fact that we just need regulation. Do you think it's reasonable that we could actually effectively regulate the internet? Because huh. it seems so omnipotent and like people, anti regulators are always one step ahead of regulation. Oh. I, I, I don't think regulation. To me, having said all this, I hate regulation. I, I, my wife has to listen to me all the time about this. And, and regulation can be a terribly destructive thing. Uh, I, but it, a, a lot of these things are ethical questions. And it would be wonderful if we had a morality about these things. And I am not, I, I'm not so idealistic as to believe that it exists. Uh, one of the big problems with the internet, and I, I'm probably wandering a little bit, is that the internet facilitates the externalization of costs. I do something, I pass the bill on to somebody else. You know, I'm a smoker, and I pass the bill on to you for taking care of me when I get sick. So we put a, 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 a cigarette tax to take care of that. And it 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 it, it turns out that so many of our concepts that were developed with the free market were developed based on the fact that there were things like local control and moral controls. And in world markets, a lot of those things fall apart. And it, it creates extremely challenging environments. And some of these things, I think, should be solved probably with regulation. like. I would love it if nobody could sell my information to somebody else without my permission. I mean, not explicit permission. And so I think there are things like that that, that you can do. But a, a lot of this is, is, is our issues of morality. So thank you very much. Please join me in